Amen. Psalm 120, now this is right after the longest Psalm, 119. Don't worry, we're not going to read that this morning. Uh, I want to talk about what, it's, what we're seeing here in Psalm 120. If you noticed, he's kind of singing the woes. He's worried about those that are around him. He's talking about violent people and lying people. Uh, he's worried about warmongers, if you noticed that last verse. Um, I want to remind you that Jesus has called us to be peacemakers, and today we stand on the precipice. We stand on the edge of a deep cliff of going to war. We live in a time when World War III, it seems, has been prophesied by every godly prophet or false prophet or news outlet. World War III, they're beating the drums. It's time to go. I want to talk about Christians calling for war. Specifically, the title of my sermon this morning is The Lies of War. There's a word, propaganda. It's information that's used to get a reaction, to cause somebody to do something they wouldn't otherwise do. To get an emotional response and cause them uh, perhaps to go against their conscience. In 1947, the United States Department of War changed their name to the Department of Defense. Now since then, we've had over 20 different incidences of war without actually declaring war as we ought to lawfully. We don't declare war anymore. We call it a peacekeeping operation or we call it a UN action. Uh, let's read this chapter. Look, Psalm 120 says, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and He heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Notice, he's crying unto the Lord. Lord, I'm outnumbered. I'm overwhelmed. I'm surrounded by liars. They're saying things that aren't true. Listen, I have to warn you. I said it on Wednesday night. I want to say it again. we got to stop listening to everything that the media, the news outlets, the TV, the Facebook feed... We've got to stop just believing everything we see. A lot of it is pre-planned fake news to get a reaction out of you. To get you to respond and to do something specifically. He calls them lying lips and a deceitful tongue. What shall be given, verse 3 says to thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty, with coals of juniper. What a statement. He says, what should we do to these liars? I know what we'll do. We'll shoot them with a sharp arrow that has some juniper that's on fire, like firewood. Whoom, hit them with a fiery arrow. That's what they deserve. Right? He's talking about punishing them. Verse 4, Woe is me, that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. These are two... Uh, different places by coordinates. One is probably Turkey, or some say it came, it's Moscow. I'm not so sure that's true, but it doesn't matter where they're at, but what is necessary to understand is this, these two separate regions had the reputation of barbarianism, if you will. They hurt the innocent. They tortured people. They were known for doing very violent acts to the innocent, both of these cultures. Woe unto me, he says, woe unto me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. It makes me wonder if he's not even in one of these places, if he's just using it as an illustration. He's like, I'm surrounded by the hateful, violent warmongers, and I'm surrounded by these barbarians that are hurting people. I think he's using those locations as an example to those that are receiving this song in Proverbs. This would have been sang. This was something they would have sung. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. Guys, as Christians, I just have to tell you, there's no time to hate peace. I am very thankful that there are not tanks in the streets. 
I am very thankful that we have the right, the, the freedom to say what we want, the freedom to practice the religion as we see fit, the freedom to own a piece of property and to have a family. Boy, these freedoms are so essential to America. And I want you to understand that all around the world, these freedoms have been whittled away by socialism and fascism and communism and a bunch of other isms are trying to take away these freedoms where you can't say what you want, you can't pray what you want, you can't live how you want. Look what he says in verse 7. I am for peace. That ought to be you. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. You bring up something and they're like, let's go to war. Why? Because they hate peace. I had a, a person say to me this week, we had an opportunity to have a car ride, and they know I'm a preacher. And they said, and we don't see eye to eye on everything. Let me just say that. But they said, you know, I really am finding as I get older that I'm just much more of a, of a peacemaker. I'm just not interested in this political speech. Let's go get them. Now, mind you, this, this gentleman has a couple teenage sons. One, I think, is about 18, and the other one's just a few years behind. I think he realizes what we're seeing in the news today, what they're setting up for, is going to cost the lives of some of our children if something doesn't stop. This morning in the Sunday School Hour, we talked about certain political aspects. I have notes I'd love to share with everybody, and, and it'll be available online soon enough. But, I, I, you know, I, we prayed for peace in the Middle East, in Israel, in Palestine, in Ukraine, Russia. We need to pray for peace in China. We need to pray for peace in Africa. North Korea, South Korea. As Christians, we need to be desiring to see peace. What's going on all around the world, it's like little events of war are beginning to kick off. And, uh, you know, I have a theory on it. It's much like the mafia as they used to operate. Now they operate in governments, but the mafia, which is Satanism, they would go around and they would start a dumpster fire and they would throw a brick through a window and they'd do another fire. Meanwhile, they can pull off a bank heist because everybody's distracted elsewhere. Problem, reaction, solution, the Hegelian dialectic. Here he's talking about, I'm surrounded by people that only want war. I try to tell them it, we need peace and they only want war. I have to remind you, Jesus said, blessed be the peacemakers. As most of you have seen recently, there's news coming out about children being slaughtered. Who knows what I'm talking about? Without giving all the details, okay? Okay. It's coming out on the news, and within a week's time of it coming out on that media outlet, they're retracting their statement saying, well, that's unverified. We can't actually say that. And the military's coming back and saying, well, that wasn't actually really true. doesn't matter. It's been retreated a million times, and every news outlet just said it as if it were a fact. And as soon as this happened, it reminded me that in the early 90s, there was a young lady, there was footage of this young lady's eyewitness testimony. She was 15 at the time, and she goes before our Congress trying to guide us into war, claiming that when Iraq invaded Kuwait, that Kuwaiti soldiers came in and they took hundreds of babies out of the incubators and they threw them on the cold floor just to die and they stole the equipment and left with the incubators. And you know what happened? The drums of war were beating and we said, you know what, it's time for the Kuwait War. You know what, it's time for the Gulf War. You know what, it's time for war after war after war. Now here we are 30 years later and we still have 30,000 troops in Iraq. It didn't take very long to figure out that that young lady was actually the daughter of a political ambassador and she was also part of a political activist movement. It was propaganda. But it didn't matter. It, by then it was too late. It had already left her lips. It already broadcast on CNN and CNBC and MSNBC and Fox. And every one of them broadcasted as if it were the truth. Even Christians repeated it as if it were, too, it were true. Well, I heard an eyewitness testimony and she said this, therefore it's true. We need to go bomb them. This new concept is introduced of fighting them before they get us. This lady later, you know, well, it just, it breaks my heart that many Christians advocated for war in Iraq, and the reasons that were given were not legit. There's a pattern of propaganda to get us to go to war. 
Now, I was telling somebody, I went to New York a couple different times for computer conference and other things, and one of the times I was in New York, it was a, very much an eye-opener, it's very diverse. Who's been to New York? I remember coming off the subway in a downtown district, a bunch of t-shirts, and there was a Muslim man there with a bunch of t-shirts he was selling, and one of them had a very Catholic-looking Jesus, and his shirt said, what would Jesus bomb? And I was offended at first. But then I realized, you know, that is what his culture perceives, is that Christianity wants to kill his people. That's what he's been told. Now, what would Jesus bomb? He wouldn't bomb them. Is the Muslim culture and religion wicked? Oh my, yes. That's not what this sermon is about. There's a sermon coming about the Muslims. I want to talk about our duty as Christians to be peacemakers and not listen to the lies of war. You know, it was in 1 Kings 22 where it was a lying spirit that presented himself to the Lord. And he said, I will go and be a lying spirit in all of his prophets. This devil, this demon said, I'll go to Ahab's prophets and I'll be a lying spirit and we'll draw him to war and he'll die in war. 1 Kings 22, 22. It was a lying spirit that sent them to war just to cause someone to die. I want to talk about the Christian just war doctrine. We don't just go and pick fights. That's called being a bully. But there is a time and a place to go to war. There is a time and a place to defend your own and to defend others. That much is true. It's clearly evident in the Bible. But it's important to have that in balance. I'm not talking about pacifism by no means. I'm talking about justified force to confront violence. If one of our church members walks out the door here and somebody uses violence to attack them, I, as a third party, would be justified to walk over there and defend her and use force to stop the violence. That's a Christian doctrine. That's an essential Christian doctrine. I'm not talking about pacifism. I'm not saying roll over and let it happen. Listen, I'm saying, here's what I'm saying, we should be soul winners, not bomb makers. God wants us to preach the gospel, not shoot bullets. Well, unless it's a church shooting day. We had that earlier in the year. We'll do it again next year, right? The whole family can learn, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with guns inherently. Uh, there's nothing wrong with pencils. I mean, it's not the pencil that misspells words, right? Well, it's, it's, it's not my fork that makes me fat, okay? <laughs> it's, so a gun isn't inherently bad. Our government is uh, using propaganda to make it look like any gun owner's bad. That's wrong. That's a lie. Don't listen to the lies of war. Why would they do that? Because they want to disarm people. Uh, you know, we live in a nation that was founded on godly principles, and the Second Amendment is not there for shooting deer. It's there to protect us against an evil government. That's what it's for. But they want to take that away. I have to warn you, there are false Christians. We are surrounded, generally speaking, by fake Christians. They have a false gospel. They believe that their works will earn them heaven. That's a false gospel that makes them a false Christian. Okay? There are many groups like that, the Pentecostals. They say you have to speak in tongues, and uh, you have to repent of all your sins. You've got to stop sinning. You know, some of them will say you have to get baptized. You've got to go under the water for your sins to go away. Those are false gospels. Two major groups, the Catholics and the Calvinists, they believe what's called kingdom theology or dominion theology. What does that mean? They mean we're going to bring it in by force. We're going to bring God's kingdom at gunpoint, at sword point. God uses me to destroy others for his kingdom on earth. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus will come down. It will be supernatural. He'll wipe out the enemies, and he'll set up his reign of peace, of peace with a wrought iron. He didn't call us to go out and do that. We don't Bring in God's kingdom by military conquest. In fact, quite the opposite. I'm in the Lord's army, and we preach the gospel. I want to give you four points this morning. and I want to be as brief as possible, but I want you to get this, and I hope it's a blessing to you. I want to talk about violence, which is a sin. I want to talk about self-defense, which is a commandment. I want to talk about defending the defenseless, which we're also called to do. And then I want to give you a warning, finally, against warmongering. Warmongering. If you would go to 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 
First Peter chapter number 2. I am in the Lord's army. Listen, you, we are in the Lord's army. Our weapons are not carnal. They're not physical. It's a spiritual warfare. My country is a spiritual country. It's New Jerusalem. Uh, and listen, I cannot in good conscience go to war against a foreign nation. You say, well, what if they attack us and they're in the streets? We're going to defend. We're going to take care of business as God has called us to do. Yeah, but did you hear country XYZ bombed country ZBL? None of my business. My politics won't let me get involved. But bigger than that, my religious constraint, when Jesus said, blessed be a peacemaker, <coughs> I've noticed recent many so-called Christians are foaming at the mouth wanting to go to war. Be careful when you wish for war. Sometimes you might get it. Be careful when you wish a curse on somebody else. That stone will roll back on you. And this is what worries me. I pray that God would continue to give us peace in America. In Hebrews 11, he uses the phrase that we are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. He says that we desire a heavenly country. You know what country I'm a citizen of? Heavenly Jerusalem. Heavenly Israel. That's who I belong to. Now I know it doesn't say that on my driver's license, and I am very patriotic. I, God bless America, and America needs to bless God, and I'm thankful for the protections He's given us. But I think sometimes patriotism gets mingled together with propaganda, and it causes us to throw our common sense out the window and sin against our conscience and have a desire to see bloodshed. We should not be bloodthirsty Baptists. We should not be carnal Christians. We need to be peacemakers. We need to love our enemy. I'm not asking you to let your enemy kill your children. I want to deal with all of these topics as briefly as possible. You're in 1 Peter 2. This is a good one to memorize. Look at verse number 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Notice we're called out of that darkness. Don't go back into it. Verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Don't get involved in this fleshly war. Don't listen to the lies of war. In fact, you know what he's saying here? Mexico. There are Mexicans in Mexico that are trusting Jesus for salvation. They're my brother. They're my brother in Christ. We belong to that same heavenly Israel. We're of the same heavenly Jerusalem. We're in the same family of God. And if Mexico and America go to war, it would break my heart to have to point a rifle at somebody that may be saved also. There would come a point where I would say, what am I doing? I am a tool for Satan to destroy lives. How do I know? What if this person's not saved and I need to preach the gospel to them? I don't want to take their life. Go to Luke chapter 3. We're talking about the lies of war. This doctrine of preemptive war was introduced. You guys know what I'm talking about? Preemptive war. We have to go do it. No, here, here it is. What was the golden rule? Do unto others before they do unto you. Is that how it goes? Wait a minute. That's backwards, right? Uh, Brother Russell's kind of giving me a mean look over there. I'm going to go over there and smack him so he doesn't get me. You say, Brother Fanning, you lost your mind. But didn't we buy into that with the whole Iraq war, the reaction to 9-11? If we don't go bomb them, we won't be safe. Well, now we're not safe because we did bomb them. Now we're at risk because we're picking fights everywhere we go. Preemptive war. Some of the lies of war. We've got to get them first. Not true. Here's some of the lies of war. It's good for the economy. Hey, everybody will get a job. Yeah, that's when they send dad off and they make mom go work in the factory to make bullets. Who's teaching the children? Oh, don't worry. They have a plan for indoctrinating your children to be good soldiers too. They'll take them from you. 
It's good for the economy. Everybody will do well. Well, that doesn't, it didn't really work out that way. About 100 years ago, we had World War I, which there was a conspiracy behind that. World War I, the result was called the Great Depression. And from the Great Depression that carried on for about 10 years, the people were just so frustrated. They were ready for any solution. And so they put these strong political leaders in power like Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin. These guys will fix it. Next thing you know, we're in World War II. World War I calls the Great Depression. Great Depression calls World War II. War is not good for the Depression. I wanted to bring a silver dollar this morning and pass it around to give you the example of what I'm talking about. One silver dollar from 100 years ago. I've got some from 1923. Uh, and forgive me for I'm working from the top of my head here. It would buy you a pound of steak a dozen eggs, a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread. Ten gallons of gas. Ten gallons of gas. Come on. Amen, brother. <laughs> right? right? I mean, back then, a silver dollar, which has intrinsic value, boy, that would really do something. But today we have paper currency that has been devalued, and it's lost 99% of its value, and then it lost it again. Right? And then they created a central bank, and they started printing debt, which is not money. And everything's messed up. Fractional Reserve Lending and the Federal Reserve Bank, that's a private foreign entity, this is what controls the finances of the world. So what does that mean? Well, they took what used to be a dollar, and now a dollar won't hardly do anything. Now you need $100 or $200 to get what you used to be able to get for a dollar. Our economy's messed up. War did not help the economy. War is not good for the economy. That's a lie. Here's another lie. War will turn your boys into men. Well, that's not true either. War is dehumanizing, it's traumatic, and it's deathly. How many of you have known someone that died in a war or lost somebody in a war? Just about every family. The older generation certainly remembers it. This newer generation they're banging the drums of war, not thinking that they might call them up or their children. I thank God for the peace that He's given us in America and the blessing that He's done for us. I, I do. And listen, I do believe that young men need to be made into men. And they need to learn how to defend themselves and work with their hands and their mind and, and all of that. We're going we're gonna to talk about uh, manhood tonight. You're in Luke chapter 3, look at verse 14. Luke chapter 3, look at verse 14. Do no violence. Here's the thought. He says, And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do no violence. He says, Do violence to no man. Neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. This is John the Baptist teaching the soldiers, Okay, you're already a soldier. What do I do? Don't do any violence. Violence would indicate to violate somebody else's rights. Lie against them, hurt them, steal from them, abuse them. Violence. Violent. Don't do that. When a police officer does something that takes away from somebody else's rights, they have done violence. They're breaking God's law. Plain and simple. Even more, war is filled with with violence. Who's heard of wartime problems? And I won't list the list, but abuses and kidnapping of children and the hurting of women. You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's commonplace. Can you get out there with a rifle and a bayonet, maybe a war hatchet, a knife, a pistol, and you're going after the first person you see because you know if you don't get them, then they'll get you and you're dead, right? Now, do you think you're walking in the spirit or do you think you're walking in the flesh? In the flesh. How can you glorify God when you're looking for somebody to kill? <laughs> kill or be killed, well, that's war. And when you're walking in the flesh and you're walking in the flesh and you're given this groupthink mentality of those people are evil because they look different than you and they talk different than you. In fact, they're so evil. You know what? We need to do evil to them. It really is a very sinister concept. Jesus wants us to be peacemakers and to pray for peace. 
it saddens me that today many Christians are praying for war. They're bloodthirsty. This is not of God. Amen. If you would go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. In Mark 3, Jesus said, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to kill it? Well, God has life, laws that we need to save life. What did the Pharisees say? When he looked on around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart. The Pharisees didn't want to acknowledge that God said, save life. He said, save life. And he got angry at them. Jesus was angry at them and being grieved for their hardness of heart. Let's make sure that we're not a hard-hearted Christian that wants war. In fact, when you run into one, why don't you say a little prayer in your heart and say, Lord... Will you give me the power through your Holy Spirit to say something to my brother so they know that they're in sin when they're calling for death of others? I believe God would use us to wake up other Christians. Remember we said in Psalm 120, they hate peace. It says they are for war. You're in James chapter 3. Look at verse 17. James 3 verse 17 but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. So our doctrine must be pure. It comes from the Bible. Then peaceable. Oh, oh. So godly wisdom in your life is going to be peaceable. It says gentle and easy to be entreated. That means you get laid back, easy to get along with, easy to be entreated. Full of mercy and good fruits. Is that, a, is that defining you? This is defining how the Holy Spirit wants to work through you. I want to make peace with people. I want to be merciful to people. I want to get along to go. You know, I, I don't want to just cause problems everywhere I go. I don't want to go around picking a fight and being a bully. He says, without partiality. Now, here's the problem. We often say, well, I like Team A over Team B. I'm voting for red team because they're right and blue team's wrong and we need to blow the rest of them up. That's not a Christian concept. He says, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteous is sown in peace of them that make peace. Sowing, that's planting. We plant righteousness in peace. And then God will grow some peace in your garden, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Go there if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. We're talking about spiritual growth in our life by being peaceable, gentle, having mercy, sowing peace, preaching peace. Peace. I'm not talking about being a, a pushover. And I, I'm going to get to that next. I remind you that Jesus said, Blessed be the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. How can people see God in my life? Well, when you're a peacemaker. John 13, he says, uh, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one toward another. It's by peace and by love you can see God's Spirit working in my life. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, if you would, find verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Don't look for an enemy to point a gun at. It's spiritual. That's the true enemy. We walk in the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know what he's saying here? Is that prayer through the Holy Spirit is more powerful than bullets and bombs. It's more powerful than any government. Go to Exodus 22. We see the wheels of war beginning to turn, and they're, they're beating that drum, aren't they? Give us your children, let's go to war. Come on, let's go kill them before they come and kill us. The propaganda is thick, and you can see things coming together. If I understand it correctly, remember correctly, I believe it was uh, age 54 was the oldest man that they drafted. Uh-oh, that means most of us aren't out of the loop yet. <laughs> well, well, Bruce, you did your stint. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> God wants us to be peacemakers. This ought to be your religious conviction. This ought to be your conscience. The problem, you know, I do believe we should teach our young men how to defend themselves. Some of the young men here practice jujitsu or Muay Thai and they know how to you know, do some stuff. 
Uh, but their daddies tell them, you don't go around using this on people. Now, if somebody messes with your sister, you know, take them out. Amen, right? Even some of the young ladies are practicing these sort of things. They ought to know how to defend themselves. Amen. That's good and godly and righteous. I want to talk about self-defense here. In Romans 12, he said, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. If it be possible. Now, the Christian just war doctrine is this, that find another option. Well, didn't Jesus say, turn the other cheek? He did. Yes, indeed, he did. And if you have a problem with me and you come at me, so much so that you smack me, come on, fight me. I should say, man, I'm not going to fight you. And you sm I'll let you smack me again. Then you pull out a pocket knife and you got a problem. <laughs> you pull out a pistol, now, <laughs> look out, right? Or you mess with my family, well, now you're crossing a line. Jesus is trying to teach us, if it, all, if it be possible at all, to end the argument peaceably. Do you know that words are more powerful than weapons? You don't believe me. There's hostage negotiators that do it every day. And with a phone call to a stranger, they talk them out of their violence to save lives. We're supposed to be like hostage negotiators. Hold on, let me talk you down. Don't do it. There's another option. What made you get so angry to this point? Help me understand you. Go ahead, pour it out. Let me understand you so you know that I care for you. And then I can say, wait, there's hope. There's another way. We can fix this. There's a solution. That's what we ought to be. Self-defense. Godly concept. Self-defense. You're in Exodus 22. Look at verse number 2. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. Pretty straightforward. Somebody breaks in your house at night and you don't know who it is. You know it's not your wife. You know it's not a friend. They're there to do something. You don't know whether it's to steal or to harm and it's in the dark and you lay them down. There's no sin on you. Now, if the sunlight's risen, as it says in the next verse, and you can see there's no threat, and you decide to kill him anyway, that's on you. If you don't have to kill him, don't kill him. If you have no choice, it's not a sin to defend life. Go to Luke 22. In fact, it's a sin when you don't defend life. And uh, you're going to Luke 22. In Esther 8, it talks about they gather themselves together and to stand for their life to destroy and to slay and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. That was a mandate from the king. They're coming to kill you. They've already said they're going to do it. So you stand for your life and you defend. And if they're coming for your little ones, you kill them. It's self-defense. We're going to protect the household and everybody around. Hey, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, doesn't he? That's true love. Jesus did it for us spiritually. Luke 22, find verse 36. Luke 22, verse 36. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take likewise his script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. How do you interpret that in 2023? He that hath no sword gun, sell something if you have to, but you ought to buy one. But wait a minute, we're peacemakers. That's right. Don't they, don't they call a pistol a peacemaker? Isn't there one they actually... <laughs> Amen. Like, oh yeah. Uh, you know, in, in a day of mass shootings, because the children are given video games of destruction, and they're given psychotropic drugs that mess with their mind, and they can't blend reality and, and, and fantasy, and they're back and forth, and their mind's a mess, and all they, they play, they shoot them up. In a time like this, you know what? You know how long, here's the statement, you know how long a mass shooting lasts? Until the second gun shows up. Somebody said it. Yep. If somebody comes in here, and they say, I'm going to shoot as many people as I want, well, they're only going to get as many rounds off until somebody turns around and says, nope, you're done, lay down, right? If nobody's able to defend everybody, well, then we got a problem. They come in and do whatever they want. So it lasts as long until the second gun shows up and takes them out. That's the old joke. That's why, you know, I carry a gun because a cop's too heavy, right? If we, 
if we have to wait on the police to get here to stop the violence, we're in trouble. So what do we do? We defend ourselves. Look at verse 38. Luke 22, verse 38. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. It is enough. Go to Genesis 14. So one of these eager young men, he says, go buy a sword. And he says, I've got two. And he's like, well, okay. You know, you maybe have a dagger and a sword, or maybe you got a pocket pistol and a long rifle. I don't know. I don't, you, know you can interpret that how you want. But uh, Jesus said, prepare to protect your house. You're going out amongst the wolves. Be prepared. Listen, first, spiritually, with your words, with the Holy Spirit, you can stop wars with the Holy Spirit. He says it in Proverbs, though, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. So we prepare the horse for battle, and we trust in the Lord for safety. Those two go hand in hand. You're prepared, and we're praying, and we pray like it's all on the Lord. I want to read this news article to you. The House Armed Services Committee voted September 1st, 2021 to extend a, res a registration for the Selective Service System, a.k.a. the draft, to include women, a move that brings the requirement one step closer to becoming law. As part of the debate on the fiscal 2022 defense policy bill, committee members voted 35 to 24 to require all Americans ages 18 to 24 to register for the draft, not just men. Back then, they were arguing over a defense bill of $740 billion dollars in 2023, it's $1.8 trillion. America is financially sinking fast. And we're sending money to foreign countries all over the world so they can buy bombs and bullets. It's not right. It goes on, this article, Florida Republican, all right, one of our guys. Maybe, maybe not. Florida, Florida Republican Mike Waltz said, if we have a national emergency that makes us have to go back to the draft, we're talking COVID on steroids, a cyber attack. And we need everyone, man, woman, gay, straight, black, brown, and we need everyone on deck. It's that bad. This is what we're seeking is to do, is to at least have a framework established. First of all, it shows you that our military isn't as honorable as it once was. We want all the homos in here. That used to be illegal. Now it's like, come on in. It's a party. And we're paying well, right? And some of you that are tied to the armed forces, you can attest. But notice he says, man, woman. Guys, they want to take your daughter's neck. Hey, we've liberated them. They don't have to be a mom and stay home and raise up children to serve the Lord. No, they can go to war. God forbid. Young ladies, listen to me. Young ladies, and we have some young ladies in here of that age. Let this be your doctrine to love peace and to hate war. And young ladies, if anybody comes to you and says, well, the government says they passed a new law and you need to go and fight in the Middle East or fight in Russia or we got to fight in Cuba or we're going to China, young ladies, listen to me. You say, God forbid, because he has. He said, blessed be the peacemaker. You say, no, no, I'm a Christian and my doctrine will not allow me to go out and be a warmonger. Jesus has commanded me to be a peacemaker and you can lock me up if you want, but I'm not going. Young ladies, don't let them take you. You're in Genesis 14, is that right? Guys, look at this. This is great. Genesis 14. I want to talk about defending the innocent. This is something we're called to do. It's a mandate. Genesis 14, 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants. Those are three great words. Armed, trained servants. His brother was stolen and kidnapped along with his family. All the ladies and the food and stuff. He armed his trained servants. They were trained. They knew how to use the weapons. He gave them weapons and said, let's go get them. 
And they did. He armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. You know, there were this war, it's talking about there were five different kings that came together and they fought this war and they took a bunch of people away and a bunch of stuff. And Abraham says, I've got 318 guys that since they were this tall, I've been teaching them how to use a sword. And I've been teaching them how to defend life. And they have good doctrine that we're here to stand for life. And if God's on my side, I have nothing to fear. And these 318 went in and killed many, restored a bunch, and didn't lose any life. Armed, trained servants. I'm not talking, listen, I am not talking about violence. Christians should not be violent. I'm not talking about insurrection. Let's go and rebel against them. And I'm talking about defending your own. Defending the innocent. Defending the defenseless. Go to Amos chapter 5 for me. We're almost done. Amos chapter 5. In Jeremiah 22, he says, Thus saith the Lord, Execute ye judgment and righteousness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong. Do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. God couldn't be any clearer. Hey, help those that can't help themselves. Don't let others run over you. You protect and you defend. Don't shed blood and don't be violent either, though. There has to be a balance in it all. In Proverbs 24, he talks about forbearing those, uh, to delivering those that are drawn unto death. You, if you can stand in the gap and save a life of somebody that's going to be killed innocently, do it. And if that means preaching the gospel to save a soul, that's a good application. If that means talking to a young lady that says, well, I'm pregnant out of wedlock, I guess I'm going to go get an abortion. And you say, wait, stop. There's hope. Don't do it. God can use that life, that baby inside of you, to grow up and be an awesome servant of the Lord. Don't take their life. We should help the helpless. We should not support the violent. As Christians, our Christian religion is different than every other religion. We're peacemakers. We have God's Spirit living inside of us. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. No other religion has it. We have the very words of God without error. In James 1.27, he says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. He says, you know what good religion is? Help the helpless and live right. We're not saved by religion, but because we believe in Jesus, that's how we ought to live, because he told us to. My final point, my fourth point is this. Don't be a warmonger. Don't repeat the lies of war. Don't call for war. Don't wish a curse on other souls. And look, I am not ignorant of how wicked and perverse the Muslim religion is. I'm not ignorant of it. I'm not putting my head in the sand. But I want you to know what God is telling you to do and how to live in your heart. You're in Amos chapter 5. Look at verse number 18. Amos chapter 5, verse number 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you that the day of the Lord is darkness and not light? You know what he's saying? There are people today saying, bring it on, let's go, World War III, and then we're out of here. I heard a guy this week, a big Pentecostal preacher, famous by name. A lot of Baptists listen to this guy. He's a Zionist politically. And he gets up there and he says, we ought to turn Gaza Strip into a parking lot. Yeah. And then while we're at it, let's go to the Temple Mount and we'll blow up the Dome of the Rock so they can put on the Third Temple and zap, we're out of here. I thought, buddy, we're reading a different Bible because none of that's in the Scriptures. Not None of it. Do you understand that third temple will be for the Antichrist? It is an anti-Christian religion that wants to do a sacrifice and have a Messiah stand there and say he's God. And yet Christians are supporting the anti-Christians as if they're going to get blessed for that. It blows my mind. They don't know their Bible. Look at it again. Amos 5, verse 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. 
or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. You know what he's saying? It's imagine you're in the woods running from a lion for your life and you get away from it and you run into a bear Rah! and you die anyway. That's the people that are saying, bring it on, World War III. They're wishing a curse on their own soul and on their own house. You're running from a lion, you run in the house, and a snake bites you just that quick. That's those that are wishing for world war right now. Go to John chapter 10. Go to John chapter 10, please. I believe it's the Christian duty to pray for peace and to not advocate for war. We should not be a war maker a warmonger. And I showed you the scriptures. You better defend yourself. You better defend your family. You better help the helpless, even if you're not related to them. You see somebody doing something evil to somebody, and you can step in and stand in the gap and make a difference and save a life. Praise the Lord. Do it if God's given you that strength and that ability. However, when Christianity, generally speaking, the big ecumenical movement that flies the same flag, when they say it's the Christian duty to go to war in Israel right now, I'm warning you, there are some lies about war. It's propaganda, and it's Antichrist. Whether or not this is it, and whether or not this is the one, and whether or not this turns into World War III, I pray that it doesn't, and I believe prayer is stronger than the war machine. Amen. Whether or not all that comes to fruition or not, we have to understand that's Satan's agenda, and God's agenda is we preach the gospel to people. I've never gotten a Muslim saved. I would like to be able, before I meet the Lord, to be able to say, I preached Jesus to a Muslim and he got saved. I'd rather say that than to say, I shot one. Rather than saying, I killed a Muslim for Jesus, I'd rather say, I preached the gospel and got one saved. That's the blessing of being a peacemaker. You're in John 10. Look at verse 10, and we'll finish here. John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The good shepherd doesn't take the life of the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sake of others. That's what Jesus did. And if you've got Jesus in you, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what he wants you to do. And he says, look out for the enemy. He wants to steal from you. He wants to kill you so that he can destroy all of the good that's in your house. If you want your house to be protected and defended, you give it to God and you say, look, I know it sounds bad over there, but guys, I'm not going to advocate for war because I don't want to go. I don't want my sons to go. I don't want my daughters to go. I don't want my cousins to go. I don't want to volunteer other people's children to go over there and fight a war because I'm emotionally motivated or politically motivated. It's not right. It's not right. Tonight we're going to talk about Satan's attack on manhood. And listen, Christians in America should not support war of any kind in the Middle East. And I just have to say it, bombing Iran does not make us safe in America. The Christian uh, witness and testimony, you know, guys, there's Muslims that live in this neighborhood. And they work at convenience stores down the road. And their children may go to school with your children or grandchildren. And if they look at their news their slanted propaganda, it's going to show a bunch of Christian Americans saying, death to Iran! And he's probably, they're probably thinking, oh man, they're going to come kill me. I've got to get ready to defend myself. Meanwhile, Fox News, you click it on and it's like, they're going to kill all those Christians if we don't go bomb them now. Don't believe the lies of war. Bombing Iran does not make us safe. They probably will attack us here anyway because we've been warmongers for generation after generation after generation. We've been bombing their houses and countries for a long time so that certain key families and groups can make financial profit off the oil and the drugs and everything else in between. And it's going to come back on Christians in America. We're being demonized. If you haven't noticed, our country is broke. It's financially broke, it's morally broke, and we need some Christians to stand in the gap and pray for peace.
He said, do no violence. Do no violence. And I would encourage you to reject that lying spirit of warmongering and preach peace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I do thank you again for the peace that we have in America. Lord, I thank you for the re religious freedom to preach the gospel in America. Lord, I ask that you would give the nation of Israel peace, that they wouldn't have war, that your name could be preached in their streets. Lord, I ask for peace in Iran and Iraq and Ukraine and Russia and Palestine and Afghanistan and North Korea, that we could preach the gospel of your name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for the peace we have. I pray that you would give us another generation or two so that we could be soul winners and not warmongers. We humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.